Making a recipe that calls for butter? Make it better with European butter from France. With a minimum of 82% butter fat, it's no wonder French butter is the number one choice for chefs the world over. Whether you're whipping up an omelet, sauteing vegetables, or spreading it on toast, the rich, cultured flavor of butter from France always elevates. Be sure to look for Made in France on the label, and for recipes, tips, and tricks, go to tasteeurope.com. It's not about like how good is the food, and it's not one of those very American, adjective heavy. It's all about the writing. So long as it's entertaining and people want to read it, and people, uh, you know, you have a following because you're a good writer. That's what matters. This is Taste. I'm your host, Matt Rodbard. Felix Salmon has lived in and around New York City for over 20 years and is one of the sharpest observers of food culture and trend around without actually officially writing about food. He's the current chief financial correspondent at Axios and host of the terrific podcast Slate Money. He's also the author of The Phoenix Economy, Work, Life, and Money in the New Not Normal. On this great episode, we talk all about New York City dining and also his family's fascinating history in the London food world. We also talk about the early snarky days of Eater and what he thinks about the future of food media. It's so great having Felix in the studio, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Felix Salmon, welcome to This Is Taste. How are you? I am I am good. Thank you. I, I just had a lovely lunch at Il Buco Alimentari, yeah. a big branzino for two with lots of olive oil and fennel and deliciousness and salumi on the side and the lovely starter of, um, what was it, Cr- Fluke Crudo. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I feel like this has set me up. I'm in a good mood. Just, Justin Smiley, I believe, is, is cooking there now or has been for a couple of years. He's it's, back. It's, it's, He's great. It's back. It's happening. I can highly recommend. Yes. Are you lunching with a source and taking them out? Is someone taking you out? What's the dynamic of this lunch? This was, yeah, this was like a, you know, one of those media lunches where media folks get together and talk about how our industry is doomed. <laughs> really? Yeah. So there were some drinks. There was there was a nice um, northern Italian white, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Well, how big is the party? Just Four? the two of us. Oh, just you and another. Yeah. Uh, just dumping some shit. Doing yeah. Some... Yeah. All right. I love Sleep Money podcast. You've been doing it for a decade. But I what I know about you, and we've never met. I just know you're writing. You're you're like a big. I mean, you're like one of the biggest supporters of downtown restaurant scene. Like I know. <laughs> no, for real. You you write about it. You're an eat, you were like early eater, whatever. Like always on the pages writing stuff or being in the pages yeah i i, I used to I, I briefly had a column at um new york magazine with alan sitzma at grub street when grub street was a thing oh my gosh it still is a thing we just had matthew the critic then it yeah alan's yeah. running the shit still i i always get confused like how did they have Eater and grub street at the same time but apparently they can as a media uh observer uh yourself you tell me i think that i, I don't know actually i don't know like I feel, I feel like it's one of those things. Like the Wall Street Journal would have, you know, the business page and the markets page and the finance page or something, and you'd be like, I have no idea what the difference is. And I'm sure that internally they all understand what the difference yeah. is. But like from a consumer point of view, if you went stopped someone on the street outside a fancy restaurant, you'd be like, what's the difference? They'd be like, uh, I can't. Tell I you. think. The- yeah, I I think the Eater uh, National uh, remit is 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 clearly their thing when they do national coverage. There you go. So that's Eater that. New York and Grub Street cover similar territory, but I, I they have different staffers and they have different points of view. I guess. I mean, right. I would say that, but um, well, there's more. But then again, you know, not media. Sometimes you so, sometimes <laughs> it will more. collapse. You know, if, you know, sometimes there will be BuzzFeed and HuffPo, and then there will be just HuffPo. Yeah, it sounds like the tea leaves have been put in front of you at this <laughs> lunch, and it was Jim Bankoff, right? That's it your... was. It was. It was me and Jim Bankoff you... talking about how it was all going to shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, you you kid. But it was, it was. I'm thinking it's fifty fifty chance it was Bankoff. But this is not a media criticism. Our read, listeners care maybe a little bit. I wanted to talk to you about many topics in in kind of the. The, the New York dining milieu and, and what's happening. But first off, Wikipedia tells me, Felix, that um, 
Salmon is a member of the Salmon and Gluckstein family who ran the Lions Tea House and Bakery Chain in Britain. Is this true? This what is, is true. Lions? What this is, is true. What is this? Um, so, yeah, my, my ancestors started a company called J Lions, which was a caterer. And we made, uh, we had Lions Tea and we had corner shops, cor- corner houses, which um, served tea and cakes. Um, we had hotels. We had like the Regent Palace Hotel, the Strand Palace Hotel, uh, the Trocadero. Mm-hmm. Um, we had lots of restaurants. Um, and so I grew up, yeah, in a catering family. Um, we had massive wine cellars under the River Thames that were like joint wine cellars for all of the hotels and all mm. of the restaurants. And my, my grandfather was in charge of those. So that was kind of awesome. Your grandfather was like the family sommelier or was he just... So, pre- something like that. He 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 actually, he of course, being like a member of, uh, of a certain sort of London class and cast, he, he, he joined a club, the Savile Club, and he... Um, he ran the wine program at the Savile Club. So, wow. Yeah. Savile he was Club. big into, he was one of the f- first English people to really embrace New World wine. Um, he got into. Or like South America? Penfolds Grange from Australia. Australia. Um, he, he was in, well, I mean, it's not New World, but he, he got into Chateau Mouzard, which is ultra, ultra old mm-hmm. world, um, long before it became like this big, you know, international thing but um yeah so i i kind of grew up in the industry in a weird way did you ever work service at any of these restaurants no and and in fact they'd all been sold by the time i yeah you know was of an age to work anywhere uh you moved to new york when what's the what's the 1997 97 i I moved here in 2002 so it's 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 a time the 90s in downtown new york i tell me your early journalism career was there a, was there a place that that like the journalists were hanging out at in New York in the early in like ninety six ninety seven oh pre blog yeah pre- because because like come come like two thousand three and blog then everyone yeah. would just hang out at the magician magician obviously um, Schiller's a little blog I pre blog I was not really in that crowd yet I was still a kind of trade journalist. And, ah. I, and and I hadn't sort of found where the cool media kids were sitting. So the cool, I'm sure the cool media kids was sitting somewhere. I just didn't know where it was. So I used to just go to Natrang on Baxter Street for lunch. That's a great spot. They were at Michael's, likely, Condé Nast, <laughs> back in 96. They were probably at Michael's. Yeah. yeah. Which I then, you know, I definitely had a brief period of um, being lunched at Michael's and it was always a whole thing because the, the there was a bunch of hedge funds around there as well. It wasn't just media, but no, it was no, mostly it was... media. So let me ask you these early early days when you're when you're reporting, um are you taking sources out to places? What's what's it like for you as an early journalist in New York? Um in the nineties less so later on it was definitely a thing and and I became a very much a lunch regular at lure on mercer street yeah right that was that was my my standard go-to place i would always take everyone to lunch and they knew me and they'd always give me a nice booth and everything was copacetic um and i'm a massive fan of just becoming a regular somewhere it doesn't even matter what it is just as long as they know you it's the best thing to do um but yeah back in the early days in the 90s that was uh, i had friends a good friend of mine was the media reporter of the wall street journal at the time and he would regale me with these stories of taking sources out to the four seasons and i was like you get to do that that's awesome <laughs> i had no idea that people could do that so when food media was born on the internet in the early 2000s i'm thinking of like eater obviously as part of it but also like blogs what was that like for you? Like the blog scene? Because I read, I went back and read, you were blogging about restaurants in 2003. You wrote, New York is changing. It's getting smaller, friendlier, less corporate, less ostentatious, maybe even a little bit more genuine. You wrote that in 2003. Yeah. That, your own that, personal blog. Those were, those were the days, right? Right. Back, back when, I mean, yeah, 2003, I didn't have a lot of money, but I felt that the there were a bunch of restaurateurs who were aiming at people like me who wanted to eat good food without spending a lot. And post pandemic, that's just impossible. Yeah. Well, we'll get into some economics because this is really the core of what you cover at Slate and just your own financial reporting. And it's a big part of your purview, but I want to just get, keep us in that era. Um, did you have a favorite chef 
or a restaurant in we'll say early 2000s that you just that you were regular at? you mentioned lure which is- uh, that was a bit later i would i would say back then the place i used to go whenever i could was 71 clinton yeah right on why did your friends play yeah. not because of the food so much as just because it was a really friendly place. It was also local. I lived just down the street. And um, Dewey Dufresne, while his dad was always there at the front, just like making your life so, just anticipating your needs and being very, very high touch, wonderful service with everyone. And he wasn't, you know, he wasn't remotely sort of snobbish about it. And that it, that just showed me what really good service yeah. was. And it, that was not an expensive restaurant at all. Definitely not, and 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 way ahead of its time, and it ended up transitioning to WD fifty, which then transitioned out to probably the most important restaurant in the two thousands, right downtown WD fifty. WD fifty, you see, I never got into it. Like that was the weird. I I I went there once or twice, and it always just seemed very precious. I that's a I agree with you. I, I was not a regular either. I was living in East Village at the time. I, I just think in terms of like pedigree. I mean, certainly it was influential, and and influential. certainly you know it had a lot of press and a lot of buzz, um, and certainly it had much more you know flashy sort of interior design and much higher price point and much higher ambitions. But yeah, that wasn't really what I was looking for at the time. Can we talk about keeping Nally now? Sure. We're gonna we're about to enter the memoir Keep McNally media cycle. I feel there's gonna be <laughs> probably a few exclusives out. There'll be some excerpts. There'll be him doing some podcasts. Should we even care? I I think he um is incredibly important, incredibly smart, and I'm you know for all that he has his idiosyncrasies, um he's the most important restaurateur in New York, recent New York history. Like, I don't think there's a number two. I don't think it's even close. Um, I think that Balthasar alone would put him on the map and make him important. Like, the sheer tonnage of food that Kitchen puts out at consistently high quality is a very, very impressive feat. And to managed to do it in a room that has been copied a million times because it is just an absolutely stunningly gorgeous room. Um, but even before then, like, Odeon created an entire culture. I'm glad you go back to that. Um, I'm glad you go back to that. And, I mean, I literally go back. I go back to Odeon regularly to this day. Yeah. I mean, it is still one of my favorite restaurants. It is completely reliable, completely fun, Ne- like the thing about Keith's places is they're never trying to do anything they're not, and what whatever they do, they do really well. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was when I lived on Rivington, when I lived on Rivington Street, I was very close to um, Schiller's, which was a great, perfect restaurant. Dining room had a lot of great light. It was a cool dining room. You know, had the playbook of downstairs bathrooms, and it had a little bit of like Polino's as well. Was kind of that vibe similarly. Um, you know, the list goes on. Um, Lucky Strike. I met yeah. some of my favorite friends at Lucky Strike just sitting next to them. We had no idea who we were, but they were, we were they were sitting at the table next to us, and literally by the end of the evening, we were invited to their wedding. Pravda. Remember Pravda? Yeah, that of course. was awesome. Yeah, Pravda, you know, the vodka club bar. I mean, it was like like lines at Pravda. I mean, it was a tough place to get into, right? At, yeah. t- at time. I mean, it was a tough, tough door. And and Great. It, you know, and and basically like his hit rate was amazing. Just absolutely astonishing. I feel Polino's is probably the only one that has bombed. That was the one on Houston? That was the pizza Ria, yeah, that Houston that's been empty since. Yeah. Obviously a very f- bad space. Something up with that place. It's been empty like for 15 years. But yeah, his hit rate is up the charts. What about Major Food Group? Let's go into another big boy kind of operator, operators of Carbone, the pool, the grill, pl- other places. Yeah, I mean, ZZ. you know, when, when, when um, they started with Palm, right? I think they started with Teresi Italian Specialties. That right. was like their first moment right. it was like rich's restaurant and yeah then they kind of moved out to and then palm like opened up next door as a kind of like yeah. Or, yeah and it took its spot and then mario opened carbone which became carbone uh on dumas <laughs> dumois let me do that again 
It was like Carmelo and now, and and now they're in like Las Vegas and Miami, and they're like a big. You know. I mean, you tell me. Uh, and the, did they just announce something with Maria? They bought Maria. They bought Maria, which is wild. They bought Maria. At least they're going to operate Maria with the same structure. I mean, what's the big story is their private club up in Hudson Yards that yep. they opened. Yeah, that's the big one because that's a that's a different level of engagement every everyone wants to be a club these days because it's yeah. that it's that wonderful like you know gym business model of get people to pay you even if they're not coming oh yeah and and if you're in hudson yards i can guarantee you they won't come <laughs> how many uh, like canceled me- meals have you had with people in hudson yards yeah it's true and yeah no hudson yards it's, is, is is a shit show it sucks um it's I a love, terrible place gciamo though it just hits that place is so good have you been there gciamo i have heard of it it's but good. I, I i've heard it's good but i mean but like there have been good restaurants there i, I went there was a david chang that place there for a hot minute and yeah that was good and then it opened and then it closed because like no one is gonna go there to eat no one's gonna go there for any reason it's just a it's a soulless place yeah every time i need to go there just to you know, because I'm going to the shed. I'm just like, really? Do I have to? It, I mean, the mall element of Hudson Yards, I think of it as two spots. There's like the, the the complex of all the restaurants, and then there's like the, the cursed mall, which is, you know, the, the food and bev strategy in there um, was, 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 was weird. I mean, it, it didn't work. So, it, but, but to answer your question about Major Food Group, if, if, um, if McNally really got the setting Right, like he's mm-hmm. like the thing that he does very well is is like interior design, really like makes people feel very comfortable. Um, what Carbone did, or what Major Food Group does, is they just bring the service up to a whole sort of like ultra extra level, and turns out there's real appetite for like being extra right now and you can see it everywhere and they've they've met the moment is that because of social media is that because you need to have um a strategy if an art direction that can be easily digested on instagram tiktok i i mean i i don't think so i mean i i am not hugely on instagram but i don't feel like carbone is like an yeah. in- inherently instagrammed place i think what it is is that if what you're looking for is an experience then it it's just like turning all of those experience styles up to 11 yeah yeah good point and and you can you can definitely try and get all of those experience styles turned up just on food alone and I recently had a lunch at Red Paperclip in the West Village. Really fucking great food. I mean, amazing food. But every other dial is turned down to zero. Yeah. You know, the decor is down to zero. The service is down to zero. And they're just like, they're super monastic and like monkish about it. And they're like, you are going to come here for the food and you're going to yeah. love the food. And I, you know, you do love the food, but that's not an experience. In order to really blow someone away with an experience you want to turn up in new york of the in houston it works you can have like places outlying and, and just do the food right i but mean new that's york the thing does. like if it was in a strip mall it would yeah, be different exactly you can do anything you want in this and, and, and also yeah if you're in houston or in la you know you can you know your fixed costs are just so much lower you can get away with some shout out more. to tatemo in houston by the way if you ever make it there that is in a strip mall amazing place doing okay. a, a like they have their the masa driven tasting menu amazing stuff just had to that's what popped in my head when i said strip mall you can do anything you want i mean i feel like the you know the best sushi joints anywhere in america are always in strip malls do not do not ask me why I know. Um, well, the parking is amazing. In, in <laughs> L.A., you know, that's the thing, right? In yeah. L.A., if you're talking about a place where I think the best sushi in the country is, it's because it has the best parking and it's easy to get to and it becomes hot. But that's just a theory. I want to transition to the U.K. press and critics and British restaurant critics. Like, hits different a little bit. Like, there's Completely. something... That, it's, 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 a, it's a different genre. Let's get into it, Felix, because I know you are a media person. You, you grew up there, so... How do you articulate the, the the British restaurant critic and the style? So the British restaurant critic is a newspaper columnist, first and foremost. The American restaurant critic... So the first thing you need to know about American newspapers is they all have cities in the name. The New York <laughs> Times, the Washington Post, the Miami Herald, right? And so if you are the restaurant critic for one of those newspapers, you will 
review restaurants in that town. And it will be intrinsically servicey. The idea is that you will go to the restaurant, you will eat the food, you will make a judgment, and then other people in that city who read your newspaper will decide whether they want to go to that restaurant and eat that food. That is not the role that a UK newspaper critic is fulfilling. The UK yeah. is a very large country. All of our newspapers are national. So if you're going around saying, here's this cool new place in Clapham, <laughs> the vast majority of your readers, probably including most of the ones in London, are just never going to think about going there. So it's not a servicey thing. It's not about like how good is the food. And it's not one of those very American, adjective heavy, like let me describe the food so you can, yeah. just, you can decide point. if you want to go. It's, yeah. it's all about the writing. It's about being entertaining. It's about talking about food more generally and talking about just more generally, more generally. You know, A.A. Gill was famous for writing restaurant reviews where he never once mentioned the food. And that's fine. So long as it's entertaining and people want to read it and people, uh, you know, you have a following because you're a good writer, that's what matters. Yeah, I think that they're the real works of, of, of journalism and, and more of a, it's more craft uh, in some ways. I think that the critics there, um, I think the American critics just think they, 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 they're driven by the polarity of it being either really good or really bad. I feel that seems to be the tendency to criticize it from here. I, or, more, or more to the point, one way or another, that's what they want to do. Like They feel like their purpose in writing the review is to say like it's good it's bad you know or you know or it, maybe yeah. it's complex whereas that is not the purpose of writing the review if you're a uk critic right it, it's not important on some level whether the restaurant is good or bad because that's not why people are reading the review no they're reading it because it's a columnist they like and they like the exactly. person and they 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 want to know what you think broadly about the restaurant or what the restaurant tells us about the state of something something and we liked adrian gill because he like had an interesting life and we like know about him right and he could just write like an angel yeah, you know so you know that's the thing so like honestly he could review carpet fabric and it would be like great. you ever meet him yeah i get to interview him one time on the phone i never get to meet the guy but um his book about sobriety is really good by the way as an aside but he he's really i miss that type of journalism coming out. Do you have any favorites that are writing currently in the UK? Do you do you even read them? I, I'm I'm putting you a little bit on the spot. Yeah, I mean, I I've you know as I say, I've been in New York since '97, so a lot of whoever is yeah. you know hot right now in the UK, I probably wouldn't even know. Um, I do always read my friend Marina Hyde whenever I see her yeah. byline pop up. But I don't even I, she yeah you know, again like she could totally right about restaurants and i'm sure she has every so i know she has every so often but it's definitely not her main thing let me ask you about your your career writing about finance you've interviewed and and covered the biggest names in specifically high finance and new york finance where are you going to eat with these guys Do you have any stories of like taking out the diamonds of the world <laughs> i mean i feel like you're part of the mix i mean you you got you got friends let's let's get, let's get some names in here let's, let's um let's, a Lloyd Blankenfield, the, the, I, I will say the Bernard the, Dan meals. Um, the the head of the chairman of Latin America at Deutsche Bank once took me out for dinner in New York and ordered a four hundred dollar bottle of Araujo, which is a California Cabernet, which was completely undrinkable. Oh. It was so like heavy and tannic and sweet and like 16% alcohol or something. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this was just like, it kind of threw me off. And what I realized a little bit then, and then recently I've had a couple, I, I've had a couple of interesting experiences where I've been just setting up a standard lunch date, not with anyone hugely important necessarily. Um, but I'll be like, you know, what kind of neighborhood do you want to go to? What kind of food do you like? Um, there was this one guy who was like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm vegetarian. I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's meet up at what used to be, I can't even remember what it used to be, Nuts and Roots. Anyway, it's now um, ABCV at the Tin Building. Oh, right on, right on, right on. And we go there and then, and he's like looking at the menu and he's a, a little bit confused. And, and I'm like, oh, we should have the doses. They're good. Oh, I love that. They brought those back. Love those. And um, well, they had them all along. 
Yeah, no, um, they had them at the old location in Union Square. Well, yeah, they they, they haven't left that yet. They, but they had them at whatever the hell the vegetarian r- restaurant was before they rebranded it as ABCV in the tin building. Oh, okay, I see. Um, but yeah, anyway, so and then and then it kind of arrives and he kind of looks at it with mild terror and it's clear that he's never encountered a dosa before in his life. <laughs> and and I remembered another time when I um, do you know shilling down in the financial district the um austrian place really great no i don't know really don't. great austrian uh, really great austrian restaurant down on on lower greenwich street or washington one or the other and i remember going there and, and saying oh my god you have you really have to order the schnitzel here it's like literally the best schnitzel in new york it's so good and my lunch companion was like great and we ordered this we both ordered the schnitzel and it came and it was crunchy and it was delicious and he kind of sheepishly admits to me halfway through that he was expecting a sausage to arrive. I love that schnitzel like gives sausage and probably dosa gives something like light and spongy and not like elongated and crispy. <laughs> People, it's like about vocabulary. And 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 the thing I've learned is that if what you're wanting to do is have a meaningful conversation over lunch and the thing that you're really doing is trying to bond with someone over lunch, you don't want people to be like, weirded out by food they haven't encountered before you want something vaguely familiar and so that's that's the lesson i've learned i did get taken out to um talking of of the pool and the grill the 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 restaurant downstairs from them what's it called lobster club yeah the lobster club right that was like caviar service lobster club yeah yeah the the lo- i went there for lunch once and i'm pretty sure it was the single most expensive lunch I've ever had in yeah. my life. Like, I think it's more expensive. If you just order what looks good on the menu and you're not paying much attention to what you're ordering, even without any drinks at all, you can easily spend like 200 bucks. Oh, day. easily a person, yeah. I mean, Teresa is similar, I think. And so I was like, huh, this, this, little, this like subterranean place that used to be brasserie yeah. and it would be cheaper to go upstairs to the grill. You know? Yeah, it's interesting how like rooms that get smaller and more exclusive, the prices go up sometimes. It didn't. It's not that small, and it's not yeah. that exclusive. I know it's definitely not exclusive. You can eat there <laughs> all the time. You know, it's not. But I think major food group is just like their their cost structure on their menus, their pricing structure um, has always been what it is, and they don't give it away. And that's Rich was on the show talking about that, and that's their prerogative. People are willing to buy it, right? Right. We're not and, and, and in fact, if you think about all of those dials that you're turning to eleven, you know, there's the the flavors in the food, there's the there's the theater of the service, there's the sumptuousness of the interiors, and then there's also the prices. That's part of the whole thing, and it is well established in the literature that if you drink a glass of wine that you know is expensive, you're going to like it more than if you think it's cheap. Right, <laughs> and, and same with th- bourbon, same with all the same with bourbon, yeah. and same with lunch. You know, if you wind up dropping two hundred dollars a head on lunch, you're like, that was something. You yeah. remember that, you know? How do you? It, it's all about getting people in for that first hit. Once people get into like the habitual nature of dining at you know twenty eight dollars for a club sandwich, right? Once you get over that hurdle as a restaurant guy. You've kind of struck gold, right? If people are willing to pay a lot, and and the, and he's kind of doing a favor for everyone else as well, right? Because he's he's widened the Overton window, so now you go out to lunch somewhere and it's seventy five dollars a head, and you're like, that's not so bad. Yeah, it's all relative, right? I want to talk about trends in CPG and trend. I mean, the way uh, like restaurants have leveraged technology better now than ever before. I think about Blackbird. These are all like just things. Do you understand Blackbird? Can you explain this thing to me? I swear to God, it is. It is like some weird crypto thing where you need to tap your phone and you get crypto into a wood block at the restaurant, and then you you, get like fractional, and then then you get, and then you can somehow like redeem (laughs) it, and it's like what? (laughs) No, like that. It's way the way too much friction. Way too much. Ben Leventhal's been on the show. He tried to explain it. I mean, it's it's a work in progress with the crypto stuff. I mean, generally speaking. Felix, I can't explain it. I know that literally <laughs> I went to Upside Pizza and they're like, put your phone on this piece of wood. And then all of a sudden I got a, a notification that I had fractional crypto. 
zooming out, it's more about the hospitality industry embracing loyalty in a way that's more than like five punches gets you a free salad. You know, it's more. I, I understand. See, I understand that right. in principle, right. but in practice, you know, as someone who you know used to be understood as a loyal luncher at Lua Fish Bar, you know, I don't want to be punching and tapping and redeeming. You know, I just want to be sat at the nice restaurant yeah. and the bowl of edamame comes out and no one's charging me for it. You it's know, not like for you. that's like that's what loyalty gets you is recognition. And the minute that you assume that someone is loyal and coming regularly, but no one in the restaurant is recognizing them or is seeing them in the reservation system and saying, "Oh, this person has been here three times in the past four weeks," like. Something is wrong already. Like adding an extra layer of tech to that, yeah, is trying to solve a problem that like should just be solved by a little bit of human intelligence. Fair enough. Great points. I've I, I've kind of like negotiated this myself, and I I think of it as a generational thing. I I wish I hate to use it as a crutch in a in a conversation because like I just think like gamesmanship on mobile is good for like if twenty six year old you know Goldman Sachs executive who's like going to Teresi and being able to check in on Blackboard and get the little ping. That's my my thought about why a simple res, resi notification. Well, if, if you find me the twenty six year old Goldman Sachs executive, then please introduce him to me because I would love to ask them about yeah. like how this thing works. Yeah. I, I am I am perfectly happy to admit that I am an old and I do not understand. No, I hate the argument. Um, the the con- I'm, we're, But I I do think that in general, you know, first open table and then resi completely revolutionized reservations in a wonderful way and it made it everything so much easier and that was good um i think the next thing that is taking off very slowly but will eventually become much more ubiquitous is being able to pay your check from your phone the minute it's dropped on the table instead of having to do that whole yeah. dance with the, the credit card and the, and the, you know, and the credit card you put the credit card down you wait for the check to arrive and then the credit card goes down and then it goes away and then it comes back and then it goes you know, yeah like all of that um you know is unnecessary and there's many places that where you don't need that anymore and that's great i mean here like going back to our original point if blackbird became a processing system you put your phone on the piece of wood and you pay for your restaurant pay for your meal um right i mean that's kind of maybe what are they getting into payments i I don't know it seems like not from what i've read and talked to them about but one of the more interesting companies that i'm very intrigued by is in kind Mm -hmm. um which is basically where in kind sort of via its diners lends money to restaurants and then the restaurants never need to pay it back they just pay it back in kind with food it's an in kind right it's the um it's, the it's kind of clever and i i like the way it works and it does mean it does make you more likely to go to one of those restaurants because you get you know the discount because wait you know, uh, this is the 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 vent the restaurant gets seed capital from these from the from it or you're saying yeah. they get seed capitals they get like money or, or just yeah whatever they need like working capital working capital is yeah I mean, the, it's like you have to be a working restaurant right and, and you know and and danny may has taken advantage of it you know like you can pay with in kind at the modern interesting I, i've never heard of this company i'd like to explore it. i think it'd be a great yeah, check it out. yeah um okay let's talk about maybe C, like cpg a little bit like grocery store grocery tech i feel like this is part of your remit talking to um economists about um a trillion dollar business in America. I mean, uh-huh. it's, it truly is a big story. Do you, Felix, dabble in that world at all? I, I've done. I've I've looked a little bit at the um, at the big trade off there, which everyone is talking about, which is the self checkout, right? And good topic. It turns out that when people self check out, they wind up not checking out absolutely everything in their carts. And this may be just sheer forgetfulness or they didn't realize that it didn't scan or it may be like conscious theft or it could be somewhere on that spectrum. But the degree to which they fail to check out absolutely everything in their carts is both quantifiable and quantified. And all of the groceries know exactly what it is. And when they encourage people to do self-checkout, they're saying, well, we know that you're going to walk out with 10% something that you didn't pay for, but it's still better for us to not have to try and hire all of these cashiers all the time because that's it is so hard with today's labor market 
because of the actual staffing time because you think about like the money spent on the like the, the wage even if it's 22 an hour it still makes more sense to hire someone who is going to avoid shrinkage than than the opposite. Well that's that's exactly the trade off that they're making. Interesting. Because it's not just the wages. It's the wages, it's the benefits, it's the cost of managing them, it's the cost of hiring them, training, you know, yeah. it's the cost of trying to make sure that if they once they quit because they're going to quit no one stays in those jobs for very long they get replaced by someone yeah. else, you know, there's a whole edifice involved in it it's very interesting we don't talk about self-checkout and like the calculated shrinkage rates i think it's super fascinating i wonder just pivoting from that do you have any personal you know thoughts on on the grocery store do you have grocery store experiences that you enjoy personally do you think you you could see like a future grocery store do you envision this so i i think we have had uh where i live in downtown manhattan we have had like uh something of a revolution in in like being able to see what a, you know what the next iteration of um amazing grocery stores could be in new york space is not at a premium if you can build a million square feet of grocery store and have a million square feet of car parking lot outside it there are great grocery stores with 30,000 SKUs, right exactly or there are great thousand. grocery stores in in america right that's not a problem but where but in manhattan it's always been difficult to try and build a grocery store um and then italy came along and italy was super interesting and very successful and now the tin building has opened yeah. up and again has been very successful and has uh, and i feel like that is an interesting model that has kind of supplanted what you might think of as the old Dean and DeLuca model that had kind of run its course. Yeah, no, we 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 celebrate Dean and DeLuca. We 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 are sad about the what happened to that brand, but we we've we've since replaced Dean and DeLuca with these two, the Tim Building, um, and Italy. I mean, I feel like the Soho Italy is 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 channeling Dean and DeLuca down to the neighborhood. Right, it's kind of it's kind of amazing. The size of it too, you know, the one that's in. Uh, Flatiron is is massive. The one downtown is a little more so much smaller, and it's mostly restaurant. Yeah. Exactly, it feels like Dean look great. Felix, it's smart. I like that. What keeps you like showing up to the mics for for Slate Money? <laughs> I love your show, and and you're you're here partially because I just enjoy. And I'm gonna link to the show and just check out Slate Money. It's a great show. Um, it's it's just it's a lot of fun. Um, and honestly, I just really want to hit that 10th anniversary party thing that we're going <laughs> to bound. Don't that, we all? That we're having in May. Taste is at seven years. We were like counting down the three years. <laughs> so 10 years in May. Wow. Yeah. You've been doing the podcast ever like since you launched? It's been literally every week for 10 years. And it's now, it's now not um, every week anymore. It's now 1.5 times a week. We have the regular show yeah. coming out every Sunday, so every Saturday, and then every other Tuesday we have an interview show which is amazing and i'm i'm really loving this new it's called money talks yeah money talks are great yeah. uh you had a great one with bianca bianca bosca we love bianca bosca she's great Terrific. go read her new book it's called get the picture it's about the art world it's fantastic and what else is your like your job in remit at, at slate are you writing column how do we read you um yeah i am writing column but it's not at slate it's at axios Oh, so, okay. um, that's my day job is at Axios. So go read the Axios Markets newsletter. If you subscribe to that on Saturdays, my newsletter will arrive. It's called Markets Weekend. All right. What's what's you writing about there? Well, as 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 it says on the tin, <laughs> uh, I, I have a pretty broad remit. I write about you're writing about a, the farmers markets. A, awesome. Exactly. I farmers markets. It. I write about it's terrific. Uh, you know, you did um, square. No, I write about one. business, economics, finance. But in a fun way. You've been a great sport. I love having you on the show. I mean, I just wanted to tap in. You're like, you're like definitely like heritage food blogger blogging. Can I call you that? You, you, I mean, you can. It it's would be terrible. it would be a stretch. I think five people read that post that you I, found I, in 2003. I, I just I like I like someone who has opinions about restaurants for a while. Um, on this is taste. We ask guests about their discerning taste. So to close this interview, here's a little rapid fire, fast and furious taste check. Okay. The best fruit. Maine lowbush blueberries. Low bush is a uh, literally what you just said. Yeah, the the the, the low down bushes where that where you only get them in like July and early August, and they're very small little blueberries, and they're packed full of flavor. The low, they're, and you put them in a blueberry pie, and you just it it is the most. Those are the one, the little ones, the little baby the little ones. ones are the, the yeah. worst vegetable. Parsnip. Yeah, 
the, the nips have not been surviving this podcast. <laughs> the the it, parsnip's taken 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 full on heat. Is that sure. a very common uh, parsnip's up there? Yep, parsnip's up there. It's a good call. Yeah, no one needs a parsnip. I mean, and I I spent four years in in Scotland where we used to eat haggis with neeps and tatties. Dude, haggis is great. Haggis is fantastic. So I mean, it's the like tatties a, are fine. The neeps, I'm not sure. The neeps, sure not so yeah. great, but it's like ha- it's like merguez. I mean, it's a beautiful like. Oh, and haggis is fantastic. So good, and I'm so sad that it's basically. I well, as far as I know, I've never once seen a haggis in the United States. Not a proper one. They used to bring like back in the day, like like McAllen and do do like pop ups and stuff with haggis. But there's a place down. In the West Village, that Scottish restaurant had, did it. Well, Something Scots? Yeah, yeah. Not Mary Queen of Scots. That was different. That, that was not in Haggis <laughs> Spot, but there was another place. Anyways, anyway. another day. Uh, your favorite American fast food chain? Like, if it has, like, a couple in California and one in, like, Oregon and it's opening a up. A chain let, we'll call in, that? In New York, like, very soon. Does that count? Even though it wasn't actually started. Are you breaking yet? news about Erewhon? <laughs> no, Din Tai Fung is what I was going to oh, say. Oh, Din Tai Fung. I feel like Din Tai Fung is the best fast food chain. It's not really fast, but it's the best food chain. Yeah. It's just what they do, they do so amazingly well. And they've clearly got the formula right. And, and you know, you can never go that often enough. It's such a great place. Yeah, I've had a good Southern California experience there. The best dessert. Baumkuchen. Oh, yeah. Baumkuchen. My, Baumkuchen is my 100% oh my God. favorite dessert and in fact a couple friends of mine just brought me back a japanese baumkuchen and japanese baumkuchen is kind of the best my guy i'll tell you in korea the baumkuchen there's like a few places that do baumkuchen there too so it's an east asia thing yeah that's mean, obviously it's german but yeah obviously yeah yeah. right but it's it's somehow happened to be made in east in the it it, it comes from salzfedel yeah tell me about it why do you like it I, 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 well, I, my mother was German. I've been eating Baumkuchen all my life and it was always my favorite. And you, and the only thing you need to know about Baumkuchen, if you've never eaten Baumkuchen, it's called Baumkuchen because it looks like a tree and it's got the tree rings. You have to, this is 100% compulsory, slice it very, very thinly, horizontally. Oh, yeah. Do not, I've seen people slice, like, get, like, like take it away. Like we had a wedding cake and there's a baum cooking wedding cake and then the, the caterers took it away and sliced it vertically. And like, like a ham. Oh. They went ham style vertically, but you want to slice it horizontally. Slice it very thin, slice it horizontal, and it's the greatest thing you will ever eat. I love the, 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 the cut technique. It's good. Your favorite cookbook of all time? On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee. Oh, yeah. It's a really cla- it's a classic. Yeah. Good one. Do you have a recent cookbook discovery favorite? Um, you know what I have as a recent discovery is which has genuinely changed my life is the combustion meat thermometer. No way, I or don't know this. Food thermometer, I should say. Combustion is like a brand, like a combustion, proper noun. Combustion is the is the brand and it is a food thermometer that is not just a food thermometer. What you do is that you can put it in the oven. It can just sit in there, no problem. It's wireless and it has oh, eight, yeah. it has eight different temperature sensor so you don't need to try and find the exact center of the food you just shove it in any old how you put it in the oven put whatever it is in the oven it can be meat it can be fish it can be um vegetables or anything you want and then it will tell you when your food is going to reach the internal temperature you want it to reach you can look at it you can look at it on your phone and and you'll show the Uh, it'll show to it i see it'll show you or there's a little um like little clock device you can also buy, which you don't need a phone. Either way, you, it'll show you what the, the ambient temperature is, what the surface temperature is, what the internal temperature is. It will show you how what fast each one is cooking. And if you're like, I'm wanting, I'm wanting to cook this lamb to an internal temperature of 125, it'll be like, yep, it'll be there in 20 minutes. That's you can Ill. time it. Does this cost like $10,000? It's not cheap, but it's not $10,000. It's, it's like $100. For a temperature that you use it like five times a week. It's amazing. Or, Love that tip. I don't know this product. Man, geez, really nice. A couple more. A cuisine you would like to learn more about? Oaxaca. You been? I, I, I've never been, yeah. but I've eaten. Every time I eat any kind of Oaxacan anything, I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever, and yeah. I love it so much, and I really want to go. Yeah, like between mezcal and like the way that you know the heritage corn is made into tortillas and beautiful things like that. And, and those Ooh. insane, like, black moles. The have. moles, of course. All the mo- oh. Amazing, yeah. Last one, your favorite sandwich. Well, I'm just going to take that lamb that I cooked yeah. with my combustion meat the moment. I'm going to have it the following day, still pink, um, with, I guess, maybe some arugula, some mustard, salt and pepper, 
In like a crusty roll. That sounds good. Yesterday. Condiment? Is, or tomorrow's lamb. Um, no condiment. Yeah, a bit of like on? mustard, maybe some mayonnaise. This has been 100% salmon-free, this conversation. <laughs> do you enjoy the fish? I do. Name, I'm, I'm the namesake? Like, you know, like, I, I, I struggle a little bit with how much of it is farmed and not that great. But a very a, a good smoked salmon is one of the great things in the world. And, you it's know, we, we are blessed here in New York to be um, the town of Russ and Daughters. And so you, ca- yes. you, cannot, you cannot live in this town without enjoying good smoke that salmon. cafe cafe is is so great their cafe and 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 get yourself to alaska during the salmon run i feel like you gotta get up there i have i have been to Alaska. the problem with alaska is that they sell their entire catch to japan if you eat salmon in alaska or if you eat crab in alaska if you eat alaskan salmon or alaskan crab in alaska there is an astonishingly high probability that that salmon or that crab has actually done the round trip from Alaska to Japan and then back to Alaska. Yeah, that's amazing. It's wild. I feel like there's a feature there for you. Your namesake. <laughs> like, let's do it. Let's... I'll swim upstream. I feel it. Felix Salmon, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining This Is Taste. Matt, thank you. Adam Reiner, welcome back to This Is Taste. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Well, we've been working on this Trader Joe's story for a few months now, and I just wanted to have you on to talk about exactly what you discovered during this reporting process. Well, first of all, everyone loves Trader Joe's. I can't think of any brand except for maybe Apple that is so has such a rabid fan base. So <laughs> before we even begin discussing this. I, I get that. I, I know that. But I think in part of reporting this story, it really was trying to get to the bottom uh, to like get to the bottom of where do these products that Trader Joe's sells come from? And in reporting that, what I learned was that there are a lot of small brands, we call them baby brands, who have been approached by Trader Joe's uh, about partnerships. And in the process of these negotiations and conversations oftentimes are left feeling like Trader Joe's isn't having these conversations in good faith. And then within a period of several months after they've been involved with Trader Joe's and talking about working together on private labeling their products, Trader Joe's releases a product that's almost exactly the same. And this is something that is happening repeatedly uh, among specifically a sector of consumer packaged good, goods brands that are selling more global flavors in the ethnic food space. Yeah, and I have to just jump in and ask you, when a brand sees a familiar version or even a copy of their product on the Trader Joe's shelf, do they have any ability to get it taken off? These m- waters are super murky because you cannot trademark a recipe, which I think gives large corporations like Trader Joe's who want to create these private label versions of products a lot of leeway to be able to say, hey, we didn't know that this was going to be construed as, as a copy. And so in general, to answer your question, I think the, the small brands really only have protection against the packaging that they use, which many times they can trademark the design of the packaging, what it looks like. But what I found in my reporting is that Trader Joe's isn't always isn't all only interested in copying or emulating recipes of some of these products. But in some cases, they're also interested in making their products look very similar to try to create, I think, uh, an illusion in the market that they're selling something that's as high quality as the products that you might see from some of these small brands. You spoke with both founders on the record and off the record. And of course, let's talk about the on the record sources. Who did you speak with? The I think the biggest story that headlines the article is Brooklyn Deli, which is owned by Chitra Agrawal. Uh, her company is based in New York, and she founded it in 2014, a really homespun operation where she started making sauces and chutneys, pickles uh, in 2000. Uh, 2021, early in the year, 
she was approached by email from someone in the Trader Joe's product development team showing interest in her products. She sent samples, she sent price guides, and then all of a sudden the communication went dark, which is something that she says is normal. You oftentimes will have conversations with retailers that don't go anywhere. Except that in this case with Trader Joe's, six months later in the summer of that same year, they released a product which is called Indian Style Garlic Achar that looks and, and has an ingredient combination that is almost exactly identical to Brooklyn Deli's roasted garlic achar. In fact, they even spelled achar the same way with a double R, even though the traditional spelling of the name only has one R. It's a particularly damning piece of information there. Yeah, and it's you know it it really makes the whole situation feel uh, that Trader Joe's in some ways is somewhat unapologetic about the way that they're doing this. Uh, so the product went on sale that year, later that year, and it created a lot of confusion in the marketplace. And people that love Brooklyn Deli were sending Chitra emails saying, "Hey, you guys are in Trader Joe's. This is so cool." But it actually wasn't cool because she had nothing to do with the product. The product was made with inferior ingredients, watered down versions of roasted garlic. That's another thing too about her product is that traditional achar is only is made usually with raw garlic, but her innovation in the product was to use roasted garlic instead. The Trader Joe's version also used a roasted garlic puree. So they obviously were going for a similar flavor profile to capitalize off of a, a marketplace that Chitra's company had created, one that did not exist prior to, well, for the most part, not mainstream. Another source of mine on the record was, was uh, Jing Gao, who owns Fly by Jing. Her Szechuan chili crisp is one of the most popular condiments, I think, in the country right now in, in the sort of gourmet food space. She sells at Whole Foods and, and other major retailers. Before uh, Jing started with her company, Fly by Jing, there really weren't, this was in 2018, there really weren't a lot of chili crisps on the market. So she basically created an entire lane for chili crisp. And now if you go to Trader Joe's, you see they have a, 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 a product which is called Chili Onion Crunch. And it has a similar jar, somewhat similar label. The ingredients are a little bit different, but in general, part of what Trader Joe's does is to create these products that look and feel a lot like the genuine article. Yeah. Adding insult to injury, Jinga would later collaborate with a hummus company on a chili crisp hummus. And of course, six months later, you roll into Trader Joe's and there's a version of chili crunch and hummus. Man, they, they're pretty shameless there. Right. They, you know, Jing and many of her uh, cohorts in the consumer packaged goods industry, they go to these food shows like the Natural Products Expo West in California, which is a yearly convention uh, for consumer packaged goods. Product, product innovators from Trader Joe's are known to lurk in the, in the convention center. And they often approach these brands about working together on partnerships. But in Jing's case, she had done this partnership for a hummus chili crunch collab with a company called Little Sesame. And then within three months later, Trader Joe's had a product, similar product, hummus with chili crunch on their shelves nationwide. And a big point in the piece is you actually reveal that this is not new. This is actually part of the fashion world, fast fashion. This was a comment that Jing made, which I think is really smart. And that is that the business model that Trader Joe's is implementing here is very similar to fast fashion brands like Zara and Shein, where behind the scenes, they're looking at what's trendy and they're trying to find the young up and coming designers where they can take those ideas and then create cheap imposter versions of them that they can sell in their stores for considerably less. And for companies like Zara and Shein to be able to co-opt ideas from small, unestablished designers makes it easier for them to avoid having there be any retribution like lawsuits or any legal challenges. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff, Adam. I have to ask you, will you be shopping at Trader Joe's? 
it's hard. You know, I, I want to say that I understand why people shop at Trader Joe's because we're living in a world where everything is so expensive and there is a value proposition to shopping at Trader Joe's. If a bag of lemons cost $1.99 at your local Trader Joe's and you walk down the street to Whole Foods and the same bag of lemons costs $4.99, then obviously it's kind of a, a bad business decision for you to, to shop there. But I think that what is most important is that when people do shop at Trader Joe's, that they understand what it is that they're buying. You know, when you go to Trader Joe's, 85% of their products are private label. There isn't a Trader Joe's manufacturing factory somewhere where they're making all of those products. Those products come from a like litany of relationships that the company has made with small purveyors who are manufacturing these items privately for Trader Joe's. And those deals, it sounds like from my reporting in this piece, sometimes have really onerous terms that can be uh, very disadvantageous to the people who are entering those deals. And they have also strict non-disclosure agreements. So if there are situations out there where small brands are getting screwed by Trader Joe's, there really isn't any way for us to know about it. All we do know is that Trader Joe's has this kind of modus operandi where they are farming out ideas from small brands, trying to find out what is trendy, also trying to acquire the highly specified knowledge that many of these producers have. You can't knock off uh, something like Chili Crunch in the same way that you can knock off something like ketchup. So part of their business model is to find ideas outside the market and then pull it under the Trader Joe's brand and sell it for $2.99. Yeah, and sell it for cheap. I'll leave it at that, Adam Reiner. Thank you so much for doing the piece. This is Taste is hosted by Eliza Abarbanel and me, Matt Rodbar. The show is produced by Shalia Harris and Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste Online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter for updates on all cool things that are happening.